and it's fables inside of that text. And it's myths inside of that text. It's intertextualized literature inside of this book. Plagiarism, right? Hell, we can even say racism, xenophobia, right? Chauvinism, right? All inside of the text. But I'm supposed to tell the truth according to this text. Make that make sense to me, for me. Make that make sense for me. Sound and logical. I'm good, you know. Like you said, I'm breathing as well. Breathing in that fresh air, that rock, as they call it, you know, the airways. <laughs> right, <laughs> so I can right. give that clear sound. <laughs> you know what right. I'm saying? We, we, were, we, were, um, we were discussing, like, when in the scripture it talks about um, why, why it might be difficult for people to even question the narrative that's been given to them. And I, I envisioned there's like an image of an elephant and the elephant's legs tied to a pole and as a baby they tie the as a baby they tie the elephant's leg to a pole and as the elephant grows older the elephant's not really taught to break away from the pole because from its youth it's been taught that the pole is robust and if he tries to move it won't work so as he gets older he has the same belief the unwavering foundational belief that even as a big elephant weighing X amount of tons, that it can't move because its legs tied to a peg. You get me? So what is what what is the most challenging thing when it comes to questioning or looking into the narrative? Uh, so the two pillars I've learned, and I was teaching my daughter this this summer. There are two pillars to religion and its functionality and really its foundation, right? It's fear and ignorance. Fear and ignorance. Religion teaches you to be afraid. And we like to say reverent, right? but it's really fear. And the other one is ignorance. Ignorance in the sense of you just know this in this circle, right? That's it. And not to question anything else. And that in itself is ignorance, right? The lack of knowledge. And then you have cognitive dissonance but that comes later on down the road. But fear and ignorance, not to question authority, not to question, um, not to question the narrative, the foundational myths, right? That's where I believe that's 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 where it sprouts from. And so from there, you know, young minds are so, you know, malleable. That's why we have the Sunday schools and that's why we have the nursery esque type rhymes and, you know, uh, Abraham had many sons, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, we have to, you know, like the alphabet, you know, we gotta, we gotta infuse it in you somehow. And then later on, you're taught not to ask questions or if something seems too ambiguous and you ask for clarity, we just told, you know, make it make sense or just follow the narrative and that's very dangerous because now you start to fill in the gaps and we see that uh, in layman's terms we see that with pseudepigraphal writings i.e book of Enoch, book of jasher jubilees pseudepigraphal writings writings attributed to the author who didn't actually write it where we look and go down a rabbit hole of that to find the answers, which is weird because when you bring those pseudepigraphal writings in the church, you're condemned because you're looking for mm. yeah, you're you're looking for reasoning, sound mm. logic. You, you look, you're looking to fill in that. You're looking to fill in the gaps that are in the Bible. That and the gaps. And so, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and so then you go down the rabbit hole of the Talmud. And again, pseudepigraphal writings, you know, uh, or even apocryphal writings, secret writings, you know what I mean? You look into that, but the church condemns you when you do that. So it's a it's a it's a very destructive uh, from my viewpoint. It's very destructive to the mind, to the mind. You know, do you think the church like having 
or banning certain books encourages people to say, wow, there must be some truth in it because it's being banned. But then when you understand, it's just the books that they just didn't put into the manual at different senates or different um, church assembly gatherings when they voted in and voted out what to put into this book, blah, blah, blah. That aids to it. That aids to it because now you're bringing speculation and, and, and uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sensationalize certain things because it's because now the mystery looms. You know what I mean? Like uh, I give you, uh, I like to bring things layman's terms. So Scooby Doo, right? We all love Scooby Doo, and it's always pretty much every episode is always pretty much the same. What was that noise? Let's go find out. <laughs> right? Who was it? Right? We, we love these mysteries. A and E mysteries. You know, I don't know about yeah. your wife, but my wife, you know, many other women, they like the mysteries. You know, who did that? Why did they do it? You know, when did they do it? You know, even our board games like Clue. You know, we love the mysteries. Again, because you can, it, it'll be, it can be sensationalized. You know, it can be blown up. You know. what what made what made you bro get into this in terms of looking into the history because we're not encouraged to look into the history so when i was putting together those videos upon videos and dissecting the bible and breaking down the bible going into jasha going into jubilees i was of the opinion and of the belief that this whole thing was historical and that I was of a linear mindset that it's all in the book, it's all in the book, it's all historical, everything is just within that book, within that text. So I stayed within that book, within that text, and it was reinforced, like you said about nursery, and Abraham has many sons, many sons as father Abraham, Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. And all these things are conditionings, just like the, the elephant with his foot on the pole. So I never questioned the narrative and I believe faithfully in the historicity of the narrative, right? Which right. is which is what you do. So then when I went to Adventism, they are like the most, I would say, pedantic when it comes to being literalists and reading the thing as it's every letter, every syllable is the way it should be in the book, right? So I had that and I never questioned the narrative. I just went with the narrative that was written and tried to explain what was written. So when I was like, hold up, some people were challenging me. And like, you know, some of these things are based on this and based on that. But at the time I was like, yo, that's gonna, that's disturbing, that's scary. I don't want to look into that. How so did you that rebut that? that? How did you rebut that? When you were given that information, how would, how did you react to that? What, what, what I, avoid, I avoided what it. I avoided, yeah. it. I avoided mm -hmm. it, you know? Um, to answer that question, I had people come up to me like on occasions, emails like, bro, have you seen this similarity with Moses and this figure that predates Moses? And I'll be like, uh, I didn't really have an answer. So I'll just avoid it, you know? Then as time progressed, and especially with certain things that took place, um, with the fallout, I call it, it made me just pause and say, hold up, how come all pastors and ministers seem to be a part of a, of a particular thing? that is dominating the particular church and they all seem to sing from the same hymn sheet so i thought okay let me look into this afresh then i started to look at what the scholars actually teach outside of just church because there's two different worlds there's a scholarly world and a scholar doesn't mean a non-bible person means a bible person or a non-bible person but they're looking at the things for historicism they're looking at the things for relevancy i started looking into these guys and they're very open with what they're talking about so what led you on your journey to look into like the historicity of it all? Because from my conception, from my perspective, I was taught not to question. You don't question the narrative. Not because they're trying to tell you, like to censor you more or less, but they're telling you because this book has everything you will ever know and ever right. need. You get me? No, I get it. So what uh, led you? Yeah, that's a good question, man. First off, it was this. The book itself. And uh, Deuteronomy 34 and 5. All right. And I'll read it. <clears throat> so Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab. First off, let's set the same. What does it say right here? The five books of, is this reverse? The five books of Moses. Yeah, that way, that way, that way, that way. Yeah. Right. The Torah, the five, five books of Moses. This is the five. So who wrote the Torah? Mr. Inman, Moses. Okay. Okay. 
Deuteronomy 34 and 5. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab at the command of the Lord. Okay. He buried him in the valley of Moab near Beth, Be Beth Peor, and no one knows his burial place to this day. Okay. Seven. Moses was 120 years old when he died. I'm just stop there. So if this is the five books of Moses and Moses wrote this, how did he annotate his own death? And it goes on. His eyes were undimmed and his vigor unabated. And the Israelites bewailed Moses in the steeps of Moab for 30 days. How did he write that? How did he write that? Right? So watch this. So, and this is just me just studying intently the Torah. Boom. Right? Since that was the law or the law, according to, uh, the Bible. I said, okay. I had been looking into and researching the JEDP. The J-E-D-P. Are you familiar? Nah. Uh, uh, maybe if you explain a little bit more. Okay. The J-E-D-P, also known as the Documentary Hypothesis, is a analytical study hypothesizing that there are multiple authors of the Torah or the Pentateuch. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm familiar with that now. Yeah. J-E-D-P, right? You have uh, the uh, uh, the Elois, the Deuteronomist, the Priestly, and the Yahweh. And we see evidence of this in Genesis, in the beginning of the Torah. Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. The two creation stories. Right. And we also see it going. Uh, we also see evidence of this in the Torah. In regards to how the God of the Bible. Is spoken of. He has multiple names. Multiple titles. He reacts to things differently. So that's where the documentary hypothesis. Uh, and the only reason it's a hypothesis. Just to clear the air. Is because we cannot pinpoint the exact authors of the J, the E, the D, and the P. Because if we did, it wouldn't be a hypothesis. It'd be like, oh no, this is how it was written. So, but that's what cracked the egg. That's what pulled the little fine thread in the sweater. And then again, you continue to read through the Torah and you see that Moses supposedly had documented his own death. Then you got to scratch your head. Two creation stories. You have God of the Bible reacting to situations differently. On one hand, he's very vengeful. On one hand, he's very uh, tyrannical in a sense. And on another hand, he's loving and forgiving. You know, things like that. Things, things, little things like that. And it's uh, almost as if there's like a bit of um, divine bipolar. For sure. And and to, answer your question, and to answer your question as well about how could Moses write a book and then die within a book, the Bible is silent on that particular topic. However, the Talmud, so when people come with this notion that Joshua wrote it and filled in for Moses, so Moses passed the baton to Joshua, Joshua ran with the faith, and this, that, and the other. Don't, it's forget, only the Ezra. Don't, don't forget Ezra. People oh, like to yeah. bring up Ezra because he was a scribe of the law. Yeah. But it doesn't mean he wrote the law. But go ahead, you know. Yeah, hundred percent, man. So yeah. a lot of these, a lot of these stories, like for me as well, when you talk to people and they say that they believe in God, or they say they believe in the Bible. Now people say, oh, if you reject this Bible, are you an atheist? That's another that's another topic to get into altogether. Uh, yeah. Just the conception that if you don't believe in a Bible God or the Bible writers who are anonymous or so on and so forth, that you abandon a concept that you were created and as a creator like, that's just weird ain't that what ludicrous that? what's that ain't that ludicrous if you it don't is, believe it's weird. Like, when you in the bible back, you think about it, it's weird you know it's like hold on you don't believe in god of the bible you don't believe you, in god at all but you know the funny thing is in this in this culture as well you know people who say i only believe in the king james bible so say i only believe in this bible i only believe so even in the the, the framework of belief and and religion even though people say they're not religious but they love religious texts even in that whole framework you have people who say i only believe in king james only 
I believe in NIV only. So even within your little matrix of belief, there's variables in what is actually belief and what is not belief and how you believe. So when people ask me, oh, what have you, do you no longer believe? I'm like, what do you mean by believe? You need to qualify and define what you mean first so I can answer the question. You understand? Because that question is comes with a lot of assumptions. Right. You want me to, because I believe in Moses, but I believe he was a mythological character. There you go. So now that explains my my position. But if you want to go further, do I believe in the Bible? Yeah, I believe in the Bible. There is a Bible that was written. <laughs> Definitely written. Yeah, we don't know by who or when, but according to the Septuagint, there were six people from the tribes of Israel and it came to 70, 71, 72, you have the Septuagint. So yeah, I believe right. in, now you need to qualify your questions about what you want me to believe and how that belief will make you feel happy that I believe what you believe. And this is the next thing. What got to me was that when you read this book, there's different gods in the book. Right. You get me? There's right. your Yahweh God or your Yah God and there's your Elion God and they're both different. And what's your thoughts on that? Like the concept that there's different gods in this book. So when people are saying they love God or Jesus was sent by God, what God sent Jesus in the first place? Oh, what man. God sent God yeah. in the Old Testament? Because it's like two. You understand? That's why I dropped Christianity. And then I went to the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, and I said, oh, man, glad I'm out of that confusion, right? Because I said, hold on. Uh, this definitely contradicts each other. So I seen the contradictions for sure, but there were still some issues in the Hebrew Bible. But with the Christianity, I said, man, that, that's kind of upside down, you know, uh, especially the spiritual cannibalism, eating flesh and drinking that blood. That goes directly <laughs> stop, stop, stop. against, that goes directly <laughs> against the law. Oh, stop, so stop, surely stop. God spiritual wouldn't cannibalism. say that. Yeah, <laughs> spiritual cannibalism. What is that? You know? And so, um, but, you know, so I'll bring this up. Uh, yeah. Right? Y-A-H, which is short for Yahweh or Yahuwah, Yahweh, Jehovah. Don't forget, Listen. don't forget Ahaya. Ahaya, you know, oh, yeah. Yeah, right? I think even Buster Rhymes said, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He got a song about yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I think even cowboys, yeah. I think even the cowboys say hi yeah or something Hi-yah. like that. I yeah, think, we, I, I mean, we got a chocolatey drink. Yahoo, it, it, it's everywhere, right? And so yeah. I said, okay, somebody came to me with uh, Yah being the moon deity or, or ancient Egyptian moon deity, and it was spelled I A H, and you spell it I A I A, right? And I was like you know immediate switch of cognitive dissonance like, hey i was just about to say cognitive dissonance because when i first heard that one somebody brought it out uh, maybe last year they brought it out and my immediate knee-jerk reaction at the time was i'm gonna defend the bible i'm gonna defend my faith because that person's an apostate yeah and i started looking into it and i was like oh 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 okay oh oh oh, oh. i couldn't even go any further in, if you're gonna be genuine and look at the thing genuinely, right. yah, I yah. Then when you go to hallelujah, everyone's put why in everything. Why, 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 why? But when you look at hallelujah, it's actually hallelujah. You're like, hold up, wait a minute. Something right. You get me? Something right. Again, back to disturb you. Back to you, bro. Yeah. No. You. Yeah. And so I looked into it and I said, oh, no. and I have to, I have to put this in here. We were taught, according to the Bible, we were taught to demonize Egypt. We were taught to demonize, and then later on, we we just totally disregard Africa as a whole. Because, you know, I got to put this in here. You know, growing up, I'm dark-skinned, right? Growing up in public schools, right? if, if, if you're darker than what people, you know, accept, they, they call you an African booty scratcher. I don't know if the viewing audience have ever been called an African <laughs> oh, booty yes. scratcher. Have you ever heard okay, that before? Okay. You I've heard, heard, I've heard of it, but it's not as common over here, to, that kind of terminology. But, yeah. Okay, yeah. So I heard that all my time. Uh, I always heard, are you an African booty scratcher? So from that point, even as a, a, a youngster, right, as a, a little youth, right, I, I seen Africa in a certain light. 
and that was undesirable. Mm, mm, mm. Then you have the uh, if you just donate five cents a day, you know, you, you know they're personifying Africa as, as you know poverty stricken and you know they're destitute. You know, you're like Africa. That seems like an undesirable place to be. I don't want to be called African. You know, none of that. And so anyway. So since Africa is being demonized, right? You bring up Ya and how it was originally the name of an African deity, right? African uh, nature, right? ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet. You're gonna switch on your cognitive dissonance and you're gonna say, I don't want anything to do with it. And that's not my God. They stole that. But then when you do the research, you realize, hold on, this that predates this. So now, again, that cognitive dissonance is, is a mofo because I say this, uh, it sparks or it is, the, it serves as an introduction, a preliminary to cognitive distortion. Right? It's either my way or no way at all. It's and either, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. I was just going to comment on that point. What's interesting about Aya or Yah, who was the goddess of new moons? Come on. <laughs> but you sort of thinking, hold on. Did, when did there's too many coincidences just like Scooby Doo? What a coincidence. When there's too many coincidences like Scooby Doo, you what? could be one of them children at home that sit down and you're like, the boogeyman is John, but you, all the evidences are saying David. But you've got that cognitive, cognitive dissonance because you really like John. And then at the end of Scooby-Doo, you realize, surprise, surprise, it's David. You understand? So when you start looking into the thing, there's Aya, right. Ya, Aya, Moon God. And I think the bull with the horns represents oh, the phases of the moon. You know what I'm saying? So then when you look at Elion of the Bible, he's depicted as a bull with horns. And you start making these connections. And then Abraham, and then the ram, and then Aries. And the new and the first of the month and the first day of the the calendar. There's just too much coincidences for it not to be coincidental, you see me? Correct. So when you try to like look into that, it's like, wow, where has this been? Why is this not taught in church? No one's gonna teach you that because you're gonna rob the daily bread, the daily donations, the daily tithes, all that system is an elaborate system knitted upon one story and another story. The Bible conditions you to be scared to question it. Because if you question it, you're under a strong delusion. If you put your hand to the plow and go back. So literally you have a book of intimidation. And a spell only works if you read it. You understand? So once you start reading this thing and getting deep into it, the book's saying, don't leave me. Don't leave me. You're like, hold up. What? This is some abusive relationship. It's, it's, it's probably one of the only books probably outside of the Quran. Where it's like, if you leave me, I'm going to curse you. I'm going to hurt you. You're like, yo, if this was a dialogue, with, a, with a, another person and they're saying look if you don't walk the way I walk I'm gonna box you in the face that's an abusive or, relationship that's an abusive isn't it this is a pimp book man this <laughs> is a pimp. no seriously I, I you know I, I've been reading the 48 laws of pimpology by Pimp and Kim right I read different all different types of books and you know I'm reading that because politi I, just my thoughts you know politicians are pimps pastors are pimps right and the way pimps work, and you know, when you hear pimps, you're thinking, oh, you're about to get slapped. No, uh, as an abuser. You know, there's more than just physical abuse. You can abuse somebody mentally. And that's what pimpology really boils down to. Mental abuse, mental distortions. And one hand, you tell me I'm the prettiest girl. And on the other hand, you're telling me I'm not worth anything and I need to walk the strip. So on to your point, Four out of the five books in the Torah is reiterated over and over uh, and over again, the foundational myth, which is the Exodus. I am the one that rescued you from the land of Egypt. I am the one that took my hand to deliver you from Pharaoh. I am the one, right? It's always, I am. I did this. I did this. So you don't forget. And then when you get to the latter part of the Torah, it tells you, if you refuse what I tell you, you're going to be cursed. So that is the foundation of the ignorance and the fear 
it's a bunch of fear it's a, it's a bunch of fear brother and it's so sad because it has our people in a mental chokehold they can't move this is a mental fool nelson they can't move to the left or to the right because even in the book in deuteronomy it tells you don't look to the left or to the right so it's a <laughs> it's a conditioning it's a conditioning, it's a conditioning bro. you see it's a it's, it's 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 a conditioning to tell you uh you're gonna get hurt if you decide to leave and so going with your point about the elephant raised up it then it has a certain mind frame you ever seen that picture of a donkey tied to a, a lawn chair um, have you seen that picture because it it. yeah. it's a donkey tied to a lawn chair and it just stays there <laughs> it just stays there it just it's like that that's it it doesn't move tied to a lawn chair wow that's it. wow that's that's where my people are at that's where we're at you know you can't move to the left or to the right because you were bound and that's that relegare you're bound to a book a doctrine a belief that has no uh not only historical evidence but it's not even probable that's the crazy part you know what the crazy, the crazy part, part is? Yeah. You've got a book that tells you don't bear false witness. Yeah, and we, we were taught this from early. What don't you bear say? false witness. What well, you got, a, you got you got a whole book that's bearing false witness on Egypt, for example. It bears false witness on the Canaanites and other people, for example. Then in the same breath, it, it assimilates the Canaanite deities. So in the next breath, you can't sleep with a Canaanite woman, but you can adopt the chief pan the chief deity in the, the Canaanite pantheon. It just, it, as you start critiquing this thing that we're not supposed to critique, it doesn't make any sense. And it's conditioning you to like or to love or highly regard a certain type of people for their own particular reasons. You understand? And it work, it fits like a glove. The way that it's a very ingenious system. Like it's very Diabolically ingenious. ingenious. It's ingenious, you know. And with all due respect, in my opinion, which is not a fact, it's like America has drank this thing like Kool Aid. And everyone's got spiritual diabetes, but that's more on the on the concept of blackening and whitening a mythological story. And then when it comes to Africa, it's like that continent is on spiritual diabetes, but it's more on just um, again singing to this mythological tune and trying to like the whole I would say the colorist narrative and all that kind of perspective. In, all right, so in America, everything's like, I'm going to blacken this narrative. Black, itty, black, black, black. <laughs> but then in Africa, they're like, we don't care if it's a white narrative. We just love Jesus. <laughs> you get me? So it's like, on both sides of this spectrum, it's a madness. You get me? I'm madness. Just like, Hold on. It's a madness. Nah. And when you look at the, the language of the God in the Old Testament, and I'm going to say God, and when you ask people to qualify the God, they don't even know what the God is and who he is. But I know what God I'm referring to. So when you look at Yahweh in the Old Testament, for example, mm -hmm. he's saying, I did this, I did that, I did this, I did that. I'm, I'm a married man. I've been married 10 years. Yeah? Come on. If I speak to my wife like that, that's not love, you know. That's some transactional love and that's some kind of abuse, bro. That's like... And you, and you oh, gonna hear, and you're going to hear something. <laughs> you're going to hear something later that evening. <laughs> It's some narcissism. Okay. Because it's not like he does it once or twice in this book of Moses that was written by Moses who died in the book of Moses. But <laughs> <laughs> what? But in this book of Moses that's written by Moses who died in the book of Moses, who's telling you about how to deal with slavery after he gets emancipated from slavery, it's weird. All right. But in this book, this God Yahweh is always telling people what he's done for them. What he's done for them, what he's done for them, which right, is kind of right. possessive. Oh, for sure. And I think it's, I think it's overkill. You only need to, and what, yeah. And that's my opinion. Back to you, bro. Not yeah, yeah. So real quick, I want to piggyback on something. Numbers twelve and three. You brought, brought something to, uh, you made me uh, remember something. Moses, uh, I say in the book of Moses, right? Twelve and three. Numbers twelve and three. Now Moses was a very humble man, more so than any other man on earth. Have you ever wrote something about yourself that way? I'm not gonna lie, that seems like a very um humble statement to make about oneself as That's well. Not a humble statement at all. <laughs> <laughs> I know I think I might write my own book, you know, I just say, look, man, Sal was a very humble guy. You know what I'm saying? I was taught that uh 
humble person doesn't call themselves a humble person. I was talking about that. But Numbers 12 and 3 make a difference. I wanted to touch on what you said and uh, how things are uh, uh, backwards. So, you know, you go to the court. You go to the court. In the court system, before you take the stand and give your testimony, you're told to put your left hand on the Bible and raise your right hand and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, right? So help, so help God. me God. <laughs> And it's fables inside of that text. And it's myths inside of that text. It's intertextualized literature inside of this book. Plagiarism, right? Hell, we can even say racism, xenophobia, right? Chauvinism, right? All inside of the text. But I'm supposed to tell the truth according to this text make that make sense to me for me make that make sense for me end of part one so this will be continued big up brother td you know how it is it's sound and logical feel free to support on patreon also check out instagram of brother td as always big up bless up think Sound and logical.